and uh, whenever I saw it, I thought there was a black bear digging in an old fallen down tree. Thinking that I'm coming across a small black bear, I pulled my nine millimeter out and I started to, I said, hey bear, a couple of times. Well, after saying, hey bear, a couple of times, this thing stood up and I realized I was not messing with the bear. And uh, it stood up and it was probably seven feet tall. I'm terrified. I just decided to kind of back off and, you know, get out of there. As I turned around, there was an even taller one about 10 feet away from me. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved. Uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. This is Susie from Southern California. You are listening to my favorite show, Sasquatch Chronicles. Happy holidays and Merry Christmas. Thanks so much for tuning in. You know, I might actually tweak that intro a little bit. Um, I I like it, but I'm going to tweak it, make it a little bit better. I like this section there at the very end uh, where the audience has a chance to participate and be put in the intro. And so I'm going to kind of remaster the intro. Uh, If you want to record something on your iPhone, uh, email it to me, Wes at SasquatchChronicles.com. And uh, I'll put you in the intro, as long as it's not something inappropriate. Uh, I'm pretty easygoing for the most part. And I wanted to give you a quick update. I'm still working on fixing the issues with the app. It doesn't happen with everyone. Uh, There's an issue where uh, after they download, people try and log in, and it it doesn't allow them to log in. And I'm working on it. Trust me, I'm working on it. Um, And it's weird that it's doing that. I mean, I had that thing tested like there's no tomorrow. I sent it out to pretty much everyone. That issue never came up. So it's something that I'm working on and I'm hoping to have resolved very soon. And this is the first time probably in eight years I've actually taken a holiday off and I plan to this year. So there probably won't be a Christmas show this year. So I apologize in advance. Uh, I'm definitely gonna take the time to spend it with family and friends and, and enjoy this time off. 
Tonight, we're going to be chatting with uh, Adam. And back in 2003, he had an encounter in uh, Missouri in the Mark Twain National Forest. I'll kind of let him go into it. We're also going to be chatting with uh, Esteban and Esmeralda. And they're going to be sharing an encounter they had this year in Virginia while camping. Uh, If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Adam to the show. Adam, thanks for coming on. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, the pleasure's mine. Thank you again. And I know this encounter took place in 2003, and you were in Missouri in the Mark Twain National Forest. Uh, If you would, would you just kind of start from the beginning? Kind of tell us what you were doing and walk us into what happened. Well, we had just moved there, me and my wife. uh, My first daughter was just born in Mark Twain National Forest. I have family all around there, so that was just seemed like the right place to go. But uh, I was always very avid to be outside and stuff like that. And I always liked all the survivor shows and I did a lot of hiking and stuff. And so that's kind of where this starts was I was uh, hiking down a, an old logging trail or deep trail that was in Mark Twain national forest. As I'm walking, you know, there's a bluff, maybe 10 or 15 feet tall on my right hand side. And then there's this meadow on my left hand side. And, uh, I kept hearing a sound of some kind and I tried to locate it. And uh, whenever I saw it, I thought there was a black bear digging in an old fallen down tree. The tree itself was not, you know, broken over. It was totally uprooted. Like you could see the root systems up out of the ground. And thinking that I'm coming across a small black bear, I pulled my, pulled my nine millimeter out. And I started to, I said, hey, bear, a couple of times. Well, after saying, hey, bear, a couple of times, this thing stood up and I realized I was not messing with the bear. And uh, it stood up and it was probably seven feet tall. It immediately started to hackle like it. The hairs on its arms and on its shoulders were standing up and kind of kind of shaking. I put the gun away because I know I wasn't going to stand a chance against, especially with nine millimeter. And immediately after I put my gun away, it took on a different gesture. It, 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 it calmed down, so to speak. And I can see this thing. I'm 20, maybe 30 feet away from it at, at tops. And, uh, I had a yellow towel with me around my neck to wipe my sweat and I wiped my sweat real quick. And, I saw an intrigue in its face over this yellow towel. I was like, okay, so it's interested in this towel. And I'm, I'm terrified. Don't get me wrong. I'm scared, scared, scared. I have no idea what I'm going to do. But I take this towel and kind of toss it onto the tree towards it. And uh, I just decided to kind of back off and, you know, get out of there. And uh, as I turned around, there was an even taller one about 10 feet away from me, uh, uh, a lot taller than than the other one. I don't remember much about the bigger one because I immediately fainted, fell out. I was get so scared. I woke up, I'm assuming, three or four minutes later because I wasn't quite sure what time I fell out or anything. As I kind of gather myself, I look inside my baseball cap and there is a leaf that's kind of folded up like a purse. And as I opened it, there was four grub worms inside of this leaf and the creatures were nowhere to be found. And neither was my yellow towel. Yeah, that's really fascinating. It sounds like it took your towel. The, my perception is that it, it, it traded of some sort, you know, I was like, okay, we'll take this and you can have this. And because, I mean, it was folded, like there was something that had folded this leaf and put it in, put these grubs in this leaf to where they wouldn't escape. The, 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 the first one that I encountered that was on the tree, uh, it was female. It was very, very female, uh, because I noticed it had large, large breasts and 
the face was very, very, very human. I remember the eyes being like a burgundy, a dark burgundy color, but the face was human. Um, if you were to shave off all the hair, it, it, it could have easily have passed for a female human. And the eyes were so, the facial expressions were so human that I was able to, you know, see that, hey, it was, it showed an interest in this, in this yellow towel. It's a scary account, especially being that close. You know, they're so large and so intimidating when you come across them. Uh, I mean, what an amazing account that you're that close to it. Uh, when you first walked up on it and you thought it was a bear, uh, I'm assuming it was bent over or maybe on all fours and by the pushed over tree, and you, you walked up, you start calling, hey, bear, hey, bear. What do you think it was doing? Uh, well, yeah, I... It could have been most likely on all fours. The root system in, that was up behind it kind of made it obscure. But yeah, it was nevertheless, it was sitting on this tree and it was pulling out this rotten, the rotten wood. Like, uh, and I assume because after I received the grub worms that that's what they were doing. They were looking for grubs and bugs. One thing about your encounter really intrigues me, Adam, is you talked about the hackle standing up. You know, all of the hair stood up as you guys are, you know, standing there making eye contact. I mean, it was reacting to you. Yes, yes. The, uh, I saw the hair stand up. And it wasn't just a still. It, 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 it kind of moved. It almost like it vibrated, almost obscuring it from the background. But once I holstered my weapon, it immediately stopped and you, I, you could feel the, the demeanor of the entire situation just kind of calm. Yeah, let me ask you, and, and I already kind of know the answer to this, but I'll go ahead and ask it because I'm sure the audience is wondering, why put your gun away? Nothing I could do. That gun wasn't going to do nothing. It wasn't going to do nothing. And I, I figured in my mind that I was going to have to use some kind of rationale. And that's you know, paying attention to the towel and facial expressions. The main thing that I did was I did not want to take my eyes off of its eyes. You know, I just kept kind of looking and, you know, moving real slow. And because it's just standing there at that point, it's no longer showing an aggression or anything. It's just kind of standing there almost as if it was just as confused as I was. You know, and of course, I, I'm not thinking Bigfoot or anything like that. I'm, I'm thinking, what in the hell is this? in front of me. Yeah, and I get what you mean. I mean, it's better to uh, diffuse the situation than escalate it. Um, let me ask you about the face. Uh, obviously, it has a nose and a mouth and everything. Can you kind of describe what you saw? It was human. I mean, it, I, I didn't see any, any the, even the nose was, was, was sharp, kind of modern-day humans. Uh, the eyes were, were human. They had intelligence and rational behind rationale behind them it, it 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 just reminded me of a very large hairy human female yeah it's strange i've heard accounts like this off the air uh, did she ever show her teeth no no she did not show her teeth she just the hackles you know and i it was a i'm, I'm guessing that's some sort of defense mechanism but uh, like i said once i holstered the weapon it it apparently it knows how it knows what guns are or it knows what weapons are because like i said once i holstered my weapon it took on a totally different demeanor and you mentioned that the facial expressions you know were very human like uh what kind of facial expressions was she showing well, with the towel, she showed intrigue. It was like, ooh, like her eyes got real wide and she, uh, you know, almost like a, like a human female going, ooh, that's pretty, you know, and that's kind of how I judged that situation was she likes the towel, you know, it's pretty to her. And that's why I just went ahead and as a gesture to throw it on the, on the tree towards her. And she, that did not make her jump or anything. She just, she literally just stood there. I mean, I was, I was terrified, but at the same time, I guess God gave me the enough rational thought to think, okay, well, this is, 
this is the way I've got to go about it. And then, like I said, once I started to back off after I threw the towel, I turn around and there's this even larger one right there. I mean, right there. He probably, with his size, he probably could have touched me if he reached out his arm. And he was much larger. And I say he, I'm, but I don't know for sure. But I came up to its chest. So it had to have been a good two, two and a half feet taller than I am. I'm 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 six two, so it was a very large creature. And as I saw it, immediately, uh, that was it. I was I was out. In most eyewitness reports, the males are definitely larger than the females. Uh, when you were looking at the female, so you're six two. Uh, what kind of? How tall do you think she was? Well, uh, I mean, from a distance of 30 feet, I would say that I, w- I probably came up to her chin. You know, she was definitely taller than me, but there was, uh, she, and she was not as broad as the male. Like how, the, I, I think what really struck me the most was how wide this thing was whenever I turned around. Because like I said, it looked like a wall. It was just right there. I couldn't, you know, and then I'm out, I pass out. And urinate on myself. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. There's no shame in that. I know you're nervous coming on the show. There's really no shame. I probably would have passed out and peed myself too as well. Um, did you, during this whole encounter, did you ever notice any sort of smell or anything? N- n- nothing that, no. No. I mean, it was just, I thought I had come across a, a, a black bear. You know, and I, I pulled my weapon out because in case it started to run, I wanted to at least be able to shoot at it or shoot in the air and make a noise to get it to run away. But when you see these things and they're that close to you, you're powerless. I really don't think that even if you were to have have a seven mag, I don't think that that would put something like that down. You know, it's just that big and beefy and bulky. I would agree with you. I would 110% agree with you. And, you know, a lot of times when people find themselves in this position, and I've talked to uh, several people who have been in positions like this, um, you know, when when there's fear and there's panic and then they have a gun in their hand, um, it's not even really a decision. I would say it's more of a reaction. They start shooting. And thank God that you had the presence of mind to try and de-escalate the whole thing. Well, yeah, that's always been a character of mine. I've I've always been able to, you know, remain calm under duress. But this was just, uh, it's so hard to explain the emotion that that goes through your mind. Because it's it's a lot. It's everything at once. You know, and you're just, your brain is going, what do you know? And this way, that way, this way, that way. I'm shaking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm scared. I'm, I'm absolutely terrified of what I saw, but like I said, it also eased a little bit whenever I noticed that she was not being aggressive. Well, you know, once those hackles went down, everything, it, it turned into almost like a, an expiration or, you know, a, a, a c- communication through facial expression. Does that make any sense? I mean, I was able to read her face and her intrigue in, into that, into the towel. Yeah, and I understand what you're saying, Adam. I know this happened to you back in 2003, so you've had a lot of time to really stop and think about what was going on and what happened. Um, Let me ask you, uh, him being right behind you, I know, again, I know you don't know and I don't know. Why do you think he was behind you? (sighs) Well, I I have no idea. I have no idea. He wasn't there whenever I walked towards the the tree, but... uh, he was right there. I don't know. Maybe he was there to assess the situation. Maybe just like any good man or father, he wants to protect his women. Uh, you know, I'm not, I, I don't know. I don't know. And I've also thought about the possibility that her hackles went down as he might have started walking up behind me. Even, even more amazingly was that this thing, I mean, he had to, I mean, you're talking a thousand pounds. And I didn't hear anything. I heard nothing walking up behind me. Let me ask you, when you woke up, um, did you tell your wife at the time what just happened? Or did you tell anyone? 
no, no, you're one of two people that I've actually told this to. One of them's my pastor. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you came on today. Like I said, I know you're nervous, and uh, this is kind of a this is a nightmare, you know, that you've been living for since 2003 uh, in the back of your head. And I do appreciate the fact that you would come on and and share it. Prior to all of this happening to you, Adam, what was kind of your take on the subject of Sasquatch? I mean, I've always found you know ghosts and supernatural stuff like that to be interesting. Never really got into Bigfoot, so to speak, until after a couple of months of me processing this, that I was like, okay, yeah, I, it, I need to, I need to look into it a little bit further. And I did find that you know there was a lot of hot spots around there in Mark Twain National Forest. You know, they have big salmon runs and trout runs and stuff like that. So it is a, it is a prime area for there to be such a large animal but uh no i didn't really you know i was just trying to figure out a good way to hike yeah i hear you you know most people who have encounters they're they're hiking they're hunting they're camping most encounters don't start off with i was looking for sasquatch and then it just doesn't work that way. Uh, most people are off doing their own thing and, and they have a, a run in with them. Um, you know, and, and having a, an encounter affects everyone different, but it kind of affects us all the same. I guess it kind of depends on your in encounter before I should say that. But how did this affect you after seeing these two creatures and having this experience? How did it affect you throughout your life? Well, I, I can tell you ever since then i have had major anxiety issues um i still have uh anxiety issues um and a lot of it is sensory overload going you know the i call it organized chaos it, it, it's very difficult for me to go into a busy grocery store because of everything around me you know there's people going left right looping around you know stopping an aisle and it just sometimes that makes me so nervous i have to i have to go out to the car and kind of collect myself so i do think that it played a big role in my mental health as far as anxiety because ultimately that was all that situation was was just a a, a push of anxiety and adrenaline and you know and it definitely definitely scared me i was I was scared. Would you want to see another one? If I did see another one, I would want it to be on a mutual basis. I do believe there's an intelligence there that a lot that could allow for that. My biggest concern about this is that now I know for a fact that these creatures exist that <sighs> We, we would do like we do anything else. We would kill them just to research them and, and do what humans do, and that's destroy. And I think a lot of the interactions that I hear about of them being aggressive is because, you know, especially with hunters and stuff, and I'm all for hunting and conservation, but they have, they're out there with these weapons, and their intent is to kill something. And I believe that these creatures are smart enough to to know that intent. They've 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 probably seen it. You know, there's probably been one right behind the tree somebody was up in when they shot a deer. I mean, it, it was just. I would want to see one under a controlled situation, but at the same time, I I would not want to see them under a controlled situation by mankind. Yeah, I think that's more than a fair answer. And, and you're right. I think when humans get their hands on things, we generally tend to destroy them. Um, not every encounter, though, is uh, someone being aggressive and these things are just innocent bystanders. I don't buy that for two seconds. There is uh, encounters where these things are absolutely hunting and and very aggressive towards people. I do think, though, if, and again, this is just my opinion from interviewing people, I, I think 99% of the time, if you turn around and you leave, they're going to leave you alone. And that's just my opinion. Yeah. And for, you know, a lot of the stories are of them just running away. You know, once they, 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 they see somebody, they, they, they run away. I think in this instance, I was so close that there was nowhere for it to go. 
there was nowhere for it to to run and hide behind bushes that it was a meadow it's it's a wooded meadow but you know all the trees in there are you know live oaks and stuff like that and i saw it stand up off of digging into this tree and it just you know i like i said i think it was just as shocked to see me as i was to see it and I wanted to ask you, Adam, you may have answered this in the beginning and I missed it, but uh, the color of the the hair was black. Was the skin color the same color? It, no, no. This it, this was human. I mean, if I could tell you their pigmentations, the, the, the skin was, I mean, you could say a little bit darker, but it wasn't black like a gorilla or or anything like that. This was a human being as far as I'm concerned. This, you know, this, the face looked human, you know, and its skin, I didn't really pay attention much to its hands. You know, I was, I was trying, I kept trying to just want to read the face, read the face, you know, and I kept thinking on larger animals, you want to pay attention to, you know, their expressions, like their ears, if they go back on horses and stuff, you know, you want to read their expressions. And that's what I was mostly trying to do. Um, I did notice, like I said, very large breasts. It was hairy from the top of the chest. The The breasts were exposed. The hair went from the shoulders down to its arms, down its arms, very long, probably about five or six inches. The torso area had some hair, but it was relatively bald. And then once it got down to the crotch area, that full hair started to pick back up again and go down the legs. Yeah, it's fascinating. I've I've heard of this type of description before. I'm curious, Adam, when you spun around and the male was standing there, um, I realize you you passed out. All of this is probably happening very, very quickly, you know, one one thousand, two one thousand, and you're out and it's probably more or less like a blur, but did he have the same sort of appearance and color as her? Man, uh I would want to say yes, but I really, I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember that much about that. It was just, you know, what felt like an eternity of me looking at him was probably two seconds, you know, just out. Yeah, I figured as much. I mean, it's, it's sensory overload. It's kind of like, um, and I'm really glad that you brought up the fact of, uh, afterwards, the anxiety and depression, and there is PTSD, and I don't want to liken it to what our, our people in the military go through, uh, but there is some residue that's left over after an encounter. There is an effect that it has on you. Uh, let me ask you, if someone were to say to you, Adam, what is Sasquatch? What would you say to them? And Adam, there's there's no wrong answer because no one really knows, but I'm I'm curious, what are your thoughts? Well, I would say that that their guess is as good as mine. But as far as from what we we know about these creatures, you know, only the people who have seen them and have had actual quote unquote confrontations with them are the ones that truly understand that these things exist. Um, I would say that because of the size, that you know, and and. It had to have left big footprints somewhere. I would say it is a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch. And I, I think they live in family units. I believe that this was a husband, quote, wife or a sister, brother, you know, and they were out doing things that humans do, uh, hunter gatherer type stuff. Do you think it's a, a natural animal? I would say that it bleeds. I would say that if you, if, from what I saw, if I could have shot it, I imagine it would have bled. Do you think it's a natural animal like a deer? Uh, absolutely. And I think it would be arrogant of us as a, as a species to think that we have discovered everything on this earth. Yeah, and I respect your answer. I mean, what an encounter, really. I mean, to be that close. And, you know, a lot of times when the Native Americans, they have in their uh, history, or you might say folklore, I say more history, uh, they talk about, um, you know, trading with these creatures. And I've often wondered, what in the world, how would you ever work out a, a trade with these creatures? You know, I think of it more like a business transaction. Um, but, you know, you kind of had a nonverbal trade with this creature 
Um, and thank God that you were level-headed enough not to uh, fire or start pointing your guns. I mean, what else are you going to do? This thing's twice your size, three times your size. You know what I mean? That was the main thing. It's like, I can't, I, I can't do nothing. You know, I have no defenses against this. Even if I were to unload a clip in this thing, it could have reached me and still, I mean, it, it, the, just the size and the bulk, it would have tore my head off with just by grabbing my neck. You know, I mean, it's, there's nothing you can do without our technologies uh, of, you know, modern weaponry and, and modern firearms. We don't stand a chance against these creatures. I would say in numbers we might, but these, this, this is a superior species that I saw. It was bigger, stronger, yeah, you know, you know, the, the hackles, it had an animal instinct to it of some kind because of the hackles, but it's smart. It thinks, it wants, it's de it desires. I think that's why it took the yellow towel. She liked the pretty towel, and she took it, and he paid for it. Yeah, that seems to be the case. That's that's the part that really fascinates me about uh, your encounter. You know, when you read a lot of uh, Native American history, as I was saying before, they talked about trading with these creatures, and it never made sense to me before. But hearing your encounter... I mean, you had a trade with this thing, your towel for, um, uh, I guess, some grubs and, and a leaf. I think you got robbed in the deal, but at least you got to walk away with your life, which is worth much more. And I know that you really haven't shared uh, this account with very many people, just your pastor and now me and, and the audience. And I really do appreciate you coming on and, and sharing what happened to you. I enjoyed chatting with you, Adam. Oh, man, no problem. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. I mean, I appreciate what you guys do on this radio show to get these things out there, because they are. Something's out there. Next up on the show, I want to welcome uh, Esteban. Esteban, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here. And I know uh, you and your wife both had an encounter this year in Virginia, and we'll be talking to her in a moment. If you would, would you just kind of start from the beginning, kind of tell us what you were doing and walk us into what happened? Yeah, so we had a weekend, me and my wife and uh, a buddy of mine, Luis Danis, we like to go camping as much as we can and get 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 out of the city, get out of town, and kind of just go and decompress out in the woods and uh, you know just go for hikes and take the dog and just just get out. Um, but one one Friday we we got out a little bit a little bit early, so we kind of packed up all our stuff and got on the road. But uh, unfortunately, we we got into some some really bad traffic and the drive usually takes about four and a half hours, four hours to get to where we go camping. And the, this time it actually took six hours. So by the time we got up there, it was already about 10 o'clock. So we get up there, it's kind of late. We make fire, we make dinner, uh, we have a few drinks and we kind of, kind of call it an, an early night, just go to bed because it's, uh, it was it was a long drive. The way the camp is set up, uh, it's at kind of like a top of a, a dirt road, and then there's a trailhead right next to it. And uh, the campsite for ground ground tents um, is about six yards away from from the road. My buddy he uses a ground tent, but I have a, a rooftop tent on my truck. And most of the time when we go camping, I can just pull into where we ever wherever we want to set up camp and. Uh, go from there but uh this time there is a little bit of a a gap so when we're out there and uh we bring my dog and and Luis Donis they they usually sleep together and me and my wife sleep together in our tent and on the truck so we go to bed we're all pretty tired and about like two or three o'clock in the morning something like that I don't really remember I didn't really check my phone um I hear a really strange like howling sound but it was like it was it was different. It was kind of like scratchy, deeper. But I I don't know. I I didn't really think much of it because, like I said, I have a rooftop tent and it's it's high on my truck. My truck's kind of lifted, and 
whenever we go camping, I, I always carry my, my pistol and my, my AR because, you know, you never know what you're going to run into out there. So I don't really think too much of it. And I just roll over and go back to sleep. In about maybe 10 or 15 minutes, it does it again. So I'm just like, what? Trying to figure out what it is, where it is, about how far it is. And uh, I kind of, kind of listen in to see if I can figure it out, but it, it doesn't do it again. So I just go back to sleep. The next morning, we wake up, normal camp day. We make breakfast. The wife goes out for a hike with the dog, and I just kind of stay around camp and hang out in my hammock and read a book and just kind of enjoy being out. And uh, we come back, we have lunch, and we all go out to this little valley area that's got just a field of wild wheat. And it was like a really nice time. It was sunset, so it's golden hour. Everything looked really beautiful. And we were kind of just in this weird little valley. And in order to get back to camp, we have to like go back up the road and where the campsite is situated, to the right, if you're looking from where I'm parked, to the right, you have the trailhead. And then a little bit up from there is kind of like a drop off, pretty steep drop off. And then it kind of goes down to the left to the road and then back down. So we go back and we make dinner and, uh, you know, do do the stuff and hang out and go around the fire and have some drinks and talk and chat. Now, when we go camping, I keep my dog off leash because he's a really well-trained dog. He just walks around, you know, secures the perimeter, <laughs> you know. And uh, after we ate dinner and having our drinks, um, we're just sitting there chatting. And uh, my wife notices that it's really quiet. No bugs. It's the middle of the summer, so you got all the all the critters making noise and stuff like that. And there's like not even any really wind. And I'm like, yeah, that is kind of strange. And then we're like, well, wh what is what is Ollie looking at? So I yell him to come over here, and he doesn't. And he's keyed in on something. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go and I have to use the bathroom anyway. So I'll go take a look and see what he's looking at and. So I walk over there, and uh, by the time I get over there, he's he's pointing. He's got his foot up. He's he's keyed in, and I'm like, "What are you looking at, kid?" He's just looking. So I look in the direction he's looking, and I start to use the restroom. And uh, there's like a clearing in the in the in the brush and the trees. As I'm looking there, I just see two eyes, and I'm kidding you not, like. 10, 15 feet away from me in these bushes. And I'm like, no way, those aren't eyes. I'm thinking it's like the moonlight reflecting off of leaves at like the perfect angle, you know, some something something weird phenomena, you know, like just the, like an optical illusion or something. And I'm thinking there's no way those are eyes. So I pull up, I pull up my flashlight and I shine it and it moves. So then I turn off my flashlight and it comes back and it's just staring straight at me. And all I can really see is just eyes. Like, I don't want to say they're glowing, but it, you, I could see them. So I don't know how else to explain it. But it wasn't like a light glowing, like a chem light or something like that. It was just really strange. So I get the dog and I come back and I sit down and I don't, tell my wife immediately what I saw but she was like something big was moving over there and this is the side that is on a cliff side not really cliff but a, a steep drop off as she's telling me that and we're talking we hear like a light twig break or like you know branches breaking and we stop and we're all like did you did you hear that and then we're just dead silent and then uh a big one, a big crunch happens. And mind you, before all of this happened, it uh, it started sprinkling a little bit on and off, and we checked the weather. It, it seemed like it was going to rain. So my buddy, like I said, he sleeps in a ground tent. He was like, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and pack up camp tonight and just sleep in the truck because 
packing a wet tent in the morning in the cold is is miserable. So we are like, yeah, you know what? That's not a bad idea. We'll get everything squared away so that we can just make breakfast in the morning and uh, head out. So this happens in in between us kind of breaking down camp. So after we hear the 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 the, the branches breaking, we're like, you know what? Let's let's kind of hurry hurry up and uh, and and pack up camp and call call it a night and get out of here in the morning. So as as we're doing this, um, my buddy calls me and he's like, Esteban, down there, and he like points down towards the road because the, the road's kind of on an on a incline and we're at the top of it and he's like down there and i'm like what are you what are you talking about and he's like look and i'm like i just i just see trees i just see trees and then <laughs> one of those trees what i thought was a tree started walking and i was like you gotta be kidding me no way so i'm like all right let's 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 get this get this going let's pack up camp and then my wife is like hey should i grab the dog and put him in the truck and i was like yeah that's a good idea and then she reminds me that i have uh floodlights around my truck to set up camp at night and stuff like that so i go and turn on the lights and i, I put the dog and my wife in the truck and i grab my ar just just cuz it's kind of a weird situation as we're packing up camp he he calls me again. This time he's it went from down the street, the road, to up closer. This time he's he's spotting it because I'm not paying really attention to what he's doing because we're kind of like in a mode of camp, uh, packing up everything so we can kind of get out of town. And uh, this, he calls me again, and this time he's he's spotting it. And there's big yellow eye shine just staring straight at him and when i look it stops looking at him and looks at me and i'm like hell no we're gonna get the heck out of here so we uh i just keep packing you know because at the same time like i didn't really feel threatened or anything like that i was more like i don't really know what the heck is going on but i know we should probably get the heck out of town i wasn't really like I said, feeling threatened or anything like that. So we just kept packing, and uh, as we're we're leaving, uh, I forgot my shovel, which we used to, you know, go to the bathroom. And my wife's like, "Babe, the shovel!" And I'm like, "Crap!" So I stop as we're trying to like hightail it out of there, jump out of the truck, grab my shovel, throw it in the back of the truck, and then we we kick rocks and uh, drive the four and a half hours all the way back to. Uh, Virginia Beach. Yeah, and I, I'm curious to ask uh, Esmeralda, your wife, uh, a few questions because I know she was there too with you. Uh, you know, when you're seeing these eyes, it's weird. They appear to be glowing. How big were the eyes and how far away from you were they? So the first time I saw them, they weren't, there was no eye shine. There was, it was just like, it's really hard to explain. There was just, it was, they were, there was just there. And uh, but I could still see them. And like I said, it kind of looked like a leaf reflecting like the moonlight or something like that. I don't I couldn't explain it um, until I, I tried to shine it with my light, but it moved out of the way. And that's when I realized that's not that's not leaves reflecting the moon. But I guess they because I saw it when it was in the bush when when, when I was with my dog about 10 or 15 feet away and i want to say they were say ba baseball sized they're pretty pretty decent maybe a little bit a little bit smaller maybe yeah the eyes are strange man the the eyes are definitely strange and you know and i know the second time you saw the the eyes they were kind of downhill and you thought it was a tree and then it started walking what did you think it was at the time when you saw what you thought was a tree walking. I have no idea. I couldn't, I like, I wasn't really processing what it was. I was just kind of in shock that, that I saw something like that. And then we could hear it moving from the right side of the camp to the left side of the camp towards that road. 
And uh, when I came back and, and sat down and I didn't tell my wife that I had seen something in the bush, but she told me that she saw something big moving around over there. I was like, what the heck is going on? Yeah, I would have been too, man. It would have spooked me. I mean, it sounds like it was more curious. It really wasn't aggressive with you guys. And um, I know Esmeralda just just uh, arrived. Uh, Esmeralda, I'm curious uh, about this night. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you great. Thank you again for uh, being here. I, I was curious. I, I was just talking to uh, your husband about this camping trip that you guys took and, you know, I know that he, he saw something walk off and he saw eye shine. Uh, from your perspective, did you see anything? Um, were you able to see the eyes or was it mainly you're hearing noises move around the camp? So when Esteban saw it, um, his friend and I also saw it because we were breaking down his tent on the other side of Esteban. And after, I saw the, after I saw it initially. Yeah. It was the same. Yeah. Yeah, he was having his experience, and we were seeing it too, but we were talking very low to each other and just kind of hurrying up the process. And um, I remember telling Esteban that I'm going to put Oliver's harness on him because there's something there. He was like, I was afraid that I would freak you out, and that's why I didn't tell you, but he saw something too. But when he saw it move or walk away from him, I also saw the backside of it. I didn't see its face, but I saw its body move. And it's it's weird because it was like a glide. It wasn't a normal, like, somebody walking through brush or anything. It wasn't rough. It was almost elegant. Like, it just kind of flowed through, if that makes any sense. That was before it switched sides. So we saw it um, on our right-hand side of our, our tent, or on our camp area in the beginning. His back is turned to the trailhead, and that's about where we saw everything. Yeah. Um, the time that we saw that it was a tree was already on the opposite side, on the left-hand side, at the bottom of the road. And the time of day it was, it wasn't... Like the moon was out, but the sun had just set. It was that weird in between. So you can make out shadows of trees and everything kind of blends together almost. So it did look like you were looking at this huge tree. Yeah, until it started walking. <laughs> like it blended into the rest of the forest and then it moved. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the creepy part. When you're out there and you're camping and you don't really know what it is and, you know, Esteban saw the eyes and then now you guys are seeing this huge hulking thing uh, walk through there. I know it was dark, but you guys are still seeing this thing and hearing it uh, kind of go around your, your campsite. And Esmeralda, I know that you've had other encounters uh, when you were younger, and I might have to have you back uh, to, to share that with us. Uh, but as far as this night's concerned, it really seems like it was more or less just kind of curious. It really wasn't being aggressive with you guys. Um, it's really cool that your dog picked up on the fact that it was there. Um, I ask everyone, you know, what do you think Sasquatch is? And there's no wrong answer. And I'll ask Estevan here in a moment. Esmeralda, what do you think Sasquatch is? I think that Sasquatch is... A lost, um, a lost species, a lost, like, not quite human, but not quite animal. It's kind of just something we haven't discovered yet. It's a fair answer. It's definitely a fair answer. You know, Esmeralda, a lot of, I will say most people, when they see Sasquatch, they'll say it's somewhere in between uh, a human and an animal, you know, and there are cases where people go, no, what I saw was very human or what I saw was very like a non-human primate. But I will say your average person will say it's in between, you know, somewhere in between a human and an animal. Uh, what about you, Esteban? What do you think Sasquatch is? Yeah, no, I'm going to have to agree because like, like you said, it's, it's not human, but it, it's not, quite an animal i don't i don't think it's some kind of lost ape species i think it's something a bit more advanced than that 
Yeah, why do you feel that way? Um, the intelligence, but then mm-hmm. also the way I don't know, just just the feeling that I get when I when I saw it and what what was going on. I I don't know. Yeah, I understand what you mean. I mean, these things really are intelligent, and anyone who says any different is is flat out wrong. Um, they're very very intelligent, and that's kind of the weird part about these creatures there's something not quite right i mean they're not really an animal and they're not quite human it's bizarre and you guys will have to be uh you guys will be careful uh camp and let me know if uh, anything else happens while you're out there but i really enjoyed chatting with both of you guys thank you so much for coming on yeah thanks for having us yeah thank you merry christmas And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. And with uh, Christmas coming up and then New Year's the next two weeks, um, I'm going to take some time off and spend it with family and try and help my shoulder recover and catch up on a couple things behind the scenes uh next year i chronicles after dark is coming i've been asked about it Uh, it's definitely coming i've just been a lot of things on my plate and then i'm trying to heal at the same time when i busted my shoulder so kind of bear with me i hope this year you guys spend time with family and friends i may sneak in between now and the end of the year and put out something Uh, We'll see how it goes, but I want to take a moment and wish you guys Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the show and, and spend time riding shotgun with me every week. Until next time, everyone. are beginning to come in by telephone from private citizens in Alaska and the northern provinces of Canada concerning that rather strange airborne object being tracked by NORAD radar units. This much is now known about the vehicle. It's red in color and shaped like an old-fashioned sleigh. The propulsion system is divided into eight units that precede the command craft, and they're shaped somewhat like horses or reindeer. There's reports the object has no national markings or other identification normally found on aircraft or space vehicles. This is Air Force Sergeant Lee Mosley at the North American Air Defense Command Headquarters in Colorado Springs, Colorado.